the placenta. Finger-like projections, or villi, from the chorion, the outermost membrane, extend into the endometrium to start the placenta, the interface between the fetal and maternal circulation. Though the two never mix, they are close enough to permit the diffusion of oxygen and nutrients from mom to the fetal blood, and carbon dioxide and waste from the fetus to mom's blood. A more detailed inventory of placental transfers can be found on Table 15.1 in your textbook. The placenta should not be considered a filter. That's the function of the liver. Alcohol, drugs, nicotine, carbon monoxide and viruses can all cross the placental membranes and get into the fetal bloodstream. The placenta of a smoking mom adapts to the drop in oxygen and increasing carbon monoxide levels by spreading itself over more of the uterine wall, so it's larger but thinner. So the chorionic villi extend into the endometrium. A prenatal screening technology called chorionic villa sampling, or CVS, involves removing some of the placental tissue to perform a karyotype. A karyotype is a technology that allows a geneticist to check for chromosomal abnormalities. We will discuss this when we talk about genetics later. Essentially, it allows for an earlier preview of the genetic health of the fetus between 10 and 13 weeks, then an amniocentesis between 16 and 20 weeks. It comes with the same risks, infections, spontaneous abortion, etc., so is only carried out if certain conditions warrant the risk, like the age of the mother, or a history of genetic disorders, etc. The placenta allows for the metabolic exchange between fetus and mother, transports and stores food, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, etc., for constant supply of nutrients, transports away wastes, like urea, carbon dioxide, etc., transports oxygen from mom to fetus, and secretes hormones, estrogen and progesterone and HCG, and allows for the exchange of maternal and fetal hormones, transports maternal antibodies as well for immunity at birth. The placenta connects the fetus by way of the umbilical cord, a rope-like structure about 60 centimeters long. It leads from the navel of the fetus to the center of the placenta. It can wrap itself around the neck of the fetus, usually can be corrected prior to delivery, or can cause fetal distress and require a cesarean section. The elantois is one of the extra embryonic membranes that forms the foundation of the umbilical cord. Most of the elantois degenerates at the end of the second month, the rest becomes the urinary bladder. Since the umbilical vein is longer than the arteries, the cord has natural twists. The vein carries oxygenated blood to the fetus. The arteries carry deoxygenated blood away from the maternal circulatory system. The fetal hemoglobin is slightly different. It has a higher capacity to combine with oxygen than maternal hemoglobin. This allows oxygen to bind to it once it's lost the ability to bind to the maternal blood. Teratogens. We've seen an image like this earlier. Congenital means what you're born with, and susceptibility to congenital abnormalities is most severe within the first two months of conception. Teratogens are agents, chemicals or microbes, that are capable of causing developmental abnormalities while in the uterus. While people may initially think of exposure to pesticides and city smog as teratogens, the most common are cigarette smoking and more severely and worse because it's so preventable, alcohol. So teratogens are chemicals or microbes capable of causing in utero developmental abnormalities. Examples include cigarettes, where carbon monoxide attaches more easily to fetal hemoglobin, and detrimental placental adaptations, nicotine also affects neural function. A smoking mom or a mom who is constantly exposed to secondhand smoke generally have underweight babies and an increased risk of stillbirths, premature deliveries and miscarriages, and later in life behavioral and intellectual abnormalities. What amount of cigarette smoke is a safe amount? The most significant teratogen is alcohol. It causes FASD, and that affects brain development also results in physical malformations of the head and face, and developmental and social disorders. It's significant because the evidence of its effects is very well documented. Deformities range from mild to acute, and can range from physical to emotional to social to mental malformations. Everybody metabolizes alcohol differently, so what amount of alcohol is a safe amount? 
Some prescription medications, like thyroid drugs and acne medications, and some biotics are also considered teratogens. Also, seizure medication like Dalantin, Integritol, and Valproic Acid. Thalidomide, used a lot in the 50s, caused significant deformities of the limbs and was banned in many countries. Once considered the greatest medical tragedy of our times, now it seems to be making a comeback for the treatment of certain cancers. It seems that thalidomide was once designed to limit morning sickness in pregnant women, and it actually prevents the development of new tissue. So while it's now in limited use to treat these cancers, and even leprosy, this understanding of how this medication actually works enables scientists' understanding of why it should never have been given to pregnant women. Some infectious diseases, like the rubella virus, can cross the placental membrane and affect embryonic development. The fetus has a 1 in 5 chance of being spontaneously aborted. Babies born after in utero exposure to the virus will have serious incurable illnesses affecting most of the organ systems of their body. Parturition, Labor and Birth In a very general sense, labor is marked by the onset of uterine contractions. These are induced by the stretching cervix which triggers the release of oxytocin. Prostaglandins facilitate the uterine contractions which push the fetus downward stretching the cervix even more. This causes an increase in the release of oxytocin, a positive feedback loop. Relaxin, not shown here, is a placental hormone produced prior to labor that causes the woman's pelvic ligaments to loosen and cervix to soften. The uterine contractions cause the cervix to open, dilate, the amniotic sac breaks, lubricating the birth canal. Dilation stage lasts from 2 to 20 hours. Taking anywhere from 30 minutes to 2 hours, the head is pushed to the birth canal, called the vagina at any other time, and crowning occurs when the crown of the baby's head can be seen. Its head turns as it is expelled from the uterus, making the rest of the delivery easier. Usually, the caregiver will suction the baby's airways of amniotic fluid and nose plugs to make it easier to take its first breath of air. About 10 or 15 minutes later, the placenta and umbilical cord, the afterbirth, are expelled. No bony structures and should be an easier delivery than the baby. There is usually some maternal blood loss as the placenta detaches and there's a risk of blood mixing between the fetal structures and the maternal blood supply. This usually causes immunosensitivity if the baby is a different blood type than mom, so he is usually given some immunosuppressants shortly after delivery. Recovery is aided by the baby suckling at the breast to keep the production of oxytocin. Variations of the regular delivery methods including different birthing positions, giving birth in a water tank, breech delivery where the baby delivers upside down, and cesarean section to avoid contact with an STI or is in distress and needs to be immediately delivered or if the woman's pelvis is too narrow. An episiotomy is sometimes performed if the baby is in danger of tearing the perineum, the tissue between the base of the vagina and the anus. A surgical cut under local anesthetic is believed by some to heal more quickly than a tear. Others feel it's the other way around and will let the woman tear. Generally, improved birthing strategies minimize this type of trauma. Lactation. Breast development is stimulated by the onset of puberty by estrogen and progesterone. During pregnancy, these hormones are elevated, causing the breasts to swell in preparation for lactation. Each breast contains about 20 lobes of glandular tissue, each with a lactiferous duct leading to the nipple. Hormones control the onset of lactation. Prolactin is produced during pregnancy from the anterior pituitary in response to the high estrogen levels to stimulate the glands into producing fluids. Milk is not released due to the high levels of progesterone. At birth, progesterone levels drop, increasing the activity of prolactin and enabling milk release. Prolactin causes milk production, but not milk flow. The sucking action of the baby stimulates nerve endings in the areola, the pigmented area around the nipple. This causes the release of oxytocin from the posterior pituitary, which targets the breast to stimulate weak contractions of the smooth muscle of the breast, forcing milk into the ducts. The first few days of lactation sees the breast produce colostrum, like breast milk but without milk fats. 
Lactation not only provides a well-balanced diet for the baby, but also a way to convert vitamins, minerals, digestive enzymes, hormones, and maternal antibodies. This is an overview of the positive and negative feedbacks and hormones involved in lactation. So in summary, lactation then involves the prolactin hormone that's produced during pregnancy. Milk flow occurs after birth when progesterone levels drop and aided by the sucking action of the newborn. The nerves in the areola are stimulated and the hypothalamus produces oxytocin which is released by the posterior pituitary. The smooth muscle in the breasts weakly contract to aid milk flow. For the first few days following birth, colostrum is produced, like breast milk, but less fat. Carbohydrates, proteins, fats, minerals, vitamins, hormones, digestive enzymes, and maternal antibodies are conferred in breast milk. Breasts are never completely emptied, but the initial milk volume when the infant first starts his meal, called the foremilk, is different in composition to the hind milk toward the end of his meal. The left is foremilk, the milk released at the beginning of a feed is low in fat and high in carbohydrates, including lactose milk sugar. The hind milk on the right is creamier and higher in fat and protein, including digestive enzymes that contribute to the chemical digestion of some of the sugars, including lactase. Lactase is also produced during infancy by the intestinal villi, but as the infant matures, the breastfeeding stops, lactase production stops, and people generally become lactose intolerant. However, in many people, the pancreas can continue to produce lactase into adulthood. Breastfeeding has numerous psychological effects, not least of which is maternal-infant bonding. The drop in sex hormones and the trauma of childbirth can make some women feel disconnected from their newborn. Breastfeeding can re-establish this connection. In vitro fertilization is usually offered to women who have blocked oviducts. Hormonal treatments are applied to ripen several secondary oocytes at once. They are suctioned out of the ovaries and combined with sperm in a petri dish. Several viable zygotes develop and are placed in the endometrium at the blastocyst stage. Usually half a dozen blastocysts are added, hopeful that one will implant and develop normally. Any additional zygotes in the petri dish can be given up for fetal stem cell research, since in Canada developing zygotes only for stem cell research is considered unethical and thus illegal. Discover magazine ran an article showing that babies born using this technology have more than twice the chance of being a low birth weight or having congenital defects and suffering developmental difficulties later in life. This could be caused by the treatments themselves, the drugs used to trigger ovulation or the freezing and thawing of embryos. What's not mentioned is the off-thought notion that not allowing nature to select the strongest sperm might be the cause of these statistics. Fertility drugs are offered to usually women to boost their fertility. Couples are considered infertile if they've been trying to conceive for a year or more. Sperm is collected artificially, maybe by a donor, and placed in the vagina for hopes of normal fertilization. Cytoplasmic transfer involves the nucleus of an older woman's egg being transferred to the enucleated egg of a younger woman. The younger woman's cytoplasm offers an improved chance of successful fertilization and implantation. GIFT is like IVF, but the artificial fertilization occurs in the oviduct. The reliability of a viable outcome is improved using this method. What could the reasons for infertility be? Well, for men, it could be the obstruction of the vasa deferentia, it could be due to a sexually transmitted infection. A low sperm count it could be genetic, or it could be lifestyle choices, maybe. Sexually transmitted infections or radiation or chemicals can cause unviable or deformed sperm. And there's also erectile dysfunction. For women, they could have blocked oviducts, sexually transmitted infection perhaps, inability to ovulate due to maybe hormone imbalances. Endometriosis, where endometrial tissues grow outside the uterus, painful at certain times of the month. Or damaged eggs due to radiation or chemicals. So to reduce our biological potential to reproduce, abstinence, don't have sex, you won't get pregnant. Also effective against STI contraction. A tubal ligation, cutting the oviducts and tying off the cut ends, may also involve cauterization of the cut ends. 
a vasectomy, the male equivalent, an easier surgery as far as risks go, and more reliable and virtually guaranteed sterility. Contraceptive pills, the most common form of birth control for women. Hormone pills that mimic the effect of progesterone and inhibiting FSH and LH release. The woman does not ovulate because her body's hormonal balance indicates she's pregnant already. Fertilization does not occur. There is also less of endometrial development, so the menstrual discharge volumes are lessened. RU486 is the so-called morning-after pill that prevents ovulation and forces menstrual discharge so a fertilized egg will not implant. Contraceptive injections or patches. Many physicians believe the need for menstrual cycles is unnecessary. Injections and patches continually provide the hormone balance to prevent ovulation and effectively stop endometrial development and expulsion. Usually a delayed return to fertility compared to other hormonal methods of contraception. Condoms, the only other male contraceptive, female condoms exist too. And diaphragms that fit over the cervix is used in combination with spermicidal jellies to prevent sperm accessing the uterus. Spermicidal jellies paralyze and kill sperm cells. Some people report allergies or irritation upon usage. And the rhythm method. Best used to assure the best chance of getting pregnant rather than not getting pregnant. Body temperature changes give an indication as to when ovulation is going to or already has occurred.